Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hello, automotive people. Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I will be your host today. Today, we are finally going to get around to part three of our three-part series involving engine air measurement or engine computer air measurement. How does the PCM or ECM, the engine controller, measure how much air is going into the engine so it can add the correct amount of fuel? And we've talked about mass airflow sensors. Uh, So check that episode out if you haven't. That was part one. And then we talked about volumetric efficiency testing and how we can utilize that in analysis of a mass airflow sensor. And in the third part today... I'd like to talk about speed density systems. So this is the alternate method. This is the other way that engine controllers will measure the air mass going into the engine. Or this maybe is a little bit less of a measurement and an inferred calculation of the air mass entering the engine, but it's the other prominent system that's used by a lot of manufacturers. Chrysler and Honda for many years come to mind. They don't use mass airflow sensors. They use a speed density system. So I'm going to reference some differences between the two uh, quite a bit through this conversation. But the focus here is, again, is on speed density systems and what's involved with them. So again, with both systems, the goal is to determine how much air is entering the engine so the proper amount of fuel can be added. Think of it like a math equation. We have got X amount of oxygen molecules entering the engine. We have to match that to the hydrocarbons uh, through the injector on time so that we get so, you know that stoichiometric mixture, if that's what we're looking for, or power output or lean mixture, whatever the computer is shooting for, it needs to know how much air are we getting into this engine, and then I'm going to add this much fuel to it to get whatever result they want out of that engine at that given time. But the first part of that, again, all has to do with measuring how much air is entering the engine. So we talked about the mass airflow sensor being the sensor. If it's a mass airflow sensor system, and then in a speed density system, it's going to be a MAP sensor, M-A-P, Manifold Absolute Pressure Sensor, that is our our leading guy in this. So the mass airflow sensor is important in a mass airflow sensor system, obviously. In a speed density system, a MAP sensor is going to be the important sensor. Not the only one involved, but the important sensor. So both of these sensors are considered engine load sensors. Uh, They're critical to engine operation, but they are going to be important in determining engine load. And that's something that I want to talk about here. Um, engine load is really the amount of air mass entering the engine. Uh, again, that's our calculation. That's what we're trying to figure out is air mass. But I want to define engine load a little bit here. Uh, the PCM, again, needs to know this air mass to add the amount of fuel. But, but when we talk about the amount of air entering the engine, that's really indicating the load on the engine. What is the amount of torque or power that that engine is putting out at at any given point is really a reflection amount of air that is entering that engine. Now, fuel plays a role too, but again, we control the fuel delivery precisely through injection pulse width, don't always necessarily exactly control the amount of air going into the engine. Yeah, the throttle plate is what is in charge, but that's largely dependent on the driver of the vehicle you know what they want at that point they're going to open the throttle the engine computer it is more in control with electronic throttle um yes but but it's got precise delivery over the fuel doesn't always have precise delivery over this air that's entering the engine so again we need to measure that air mass precisely that's the purpose of these sensors and again if you want to make that very simple more air you need more fuel So you get more heat energy that's going to push the piston down in the engine. So I got a question for you. Does RPM and engine load always reflect one another? Is there a linear 
connection between the two. If RPM goes up, is load always going to go up with it? Uh, maybe simpler put, is the load of the engine the same any time the engine's spinning at 3,000 RPM? Okay, so think about an engine running in a vehicle. You can get it up to 3,000 RPM in park. You could get it up to 3,000 RPM in neutral, or you could get it up to 3,000 RPM in drive. Is the load on the engine, or is the amount of air entering the engine, going to be the same under both scenarios? And I think you know the answer to that. It's not going to be. And you could even look at this yourself. I mean, find a vehicle that has a mass airflow sensor and put the vehicle in park, rev it up to two, three thousand. Let, let's pick an RPM. Let's let's pick two thousand because this is doable. And look at the air mass entering the engine. So two thousand RPM in park, and you barely have to press the accelerator pedal here to do this and you'll get a certain amount of air mass entering the engine at that point. Now do that same thing power braking the vehicle, and be safe if you do this, but watch the air mass at 2000 RPM in gear. That air mass entering the engine at that point is going to be much, much higher than it is in park. And the whole reason is engine load. What is the resistance to that crankshaft spinning? And of course, if you're in gear, the engine's pushing against the weight of the vehicle if you're power braking it or if you're out driving it the engine the crankshaft the pistons all have to push against the weight of the vehicle here but in park you're not really pushing against the weight of anything besides the engine spinning and you know the torque converter and so it takes very little heat energy very little air to enter that engine to spin up to 3000 RPM. But in a power braking scenario, it's gonna take a lot more heat energy, it's gonna take a lot more force to push those pistons to get the engine up to that speed. And that's engine load, that's all that is. There's a higher engine load when there's a resistance on that crankshaft to spin. So my point of this again is that engine RPM is not a good enough indicator for engine load. We need, we need more than that. And this is the reason for these load sensors. We can't just make a calculation on fuel delivery based on how fast the engine's spinning. The engine computer needs to know how much air is entering it because at a given RPM, the amount of air mass entering the engine could change depending on what the crankshaft has to push on. It needs to know how much air is entering that engine in order to make a proper fuel calculation. That's the purpose of these sensors. That's the purpose of a speed density system or mass airflow system. Now in a mass airflow system, we're actually making a measurement of the incoming air going into the engine. And we talked about that in the first episode, how that works. But how does this work in a speed density system? Because a speed density system does not use a mass airflow sensor. It is not making an actual measurement of air mass entering the engine. So what is it doing? Well, it's going to make a calculation. And again, the MAP or manifold absolute pressure sensor is important in that measures the pressure inside the intake manifold. But there are some other things that come into play when the PCM is making a calculation. How much air is going in the engine at this point? Engine size is obviously important. What's the displacement of the engine? How fast the engine is spinning? That is part of the calculation, not all of it, but is part of the calculation. What is the temperature of the incoming air? Because that's going to change the density of it. What's the barometric pressure? And that is a measurement that's taken at a certain point because what's the weight of the atmosphere pushing air into this engine? That's part of this calculation. What is the throttle position? You know, is it open? Is it closed? Halfway? That's going to make a difference. And this is where the MAP sensor comes in. What is the pressure inside the manifold? That's a big one in this calculation. So let me go over those just one more time in our speed density calculation. Engine size, engine speed, temperature of the air coming in, barometric pressure, throttle position, and manifold pressure. With that calculation, and I'm not putting out numbers here, but those are the players involved in that calculation. With that calculation, the computer can determine roughly how much air is actually entering that engine. So that's our speed density system. It can make a calculation on the incoming air, determine engine load without a mass airflow sensor. Now, the reason that I'm bringing up speed density system and how it's different is that these two systems are going to react to 
problems differently. Okay, so a mass airflow system will react one way to a problem and a speed density system will react differently. So we need to know how to diagnose these systems differently. And a lot of people do. You may know exactly you know, where I'm going with this, but I see a lot of people that don't. And quite honestly, for quite some time, I didn't. I, you know, I didn't always think about what type of air measurement system I'm dealing with. So first step, you need to know what you're working on. Again, take a look at the air duct and see if there's a mass airflow sensor. Now, if the mass airflow sensor is there, it's a mass airflow sensor system. If it does not have a mass airflow sensor, it's most likely a speed density system. Uh, now make sure you look at the air duct and the air filter and even the throttle body in some cases. But if you don't see a mass airflow, it's a speed density. Uh, the one caveat to this is that there are systems that use both that have a mass airflow and a MAP sensor, manifold absolute pressure. Those systems can utilize both sensors. And that gets a little tricky on how that particular application is going to react to a problem. I, I can say for the most part, the mass airflow sensor is dominant, meaning the reflection of problems is going to lean towards a mass airflow system in those vehicles, but I can't say that's always true. So if you're dealing with a system that has both a MAP and a MAF, there might be a little question mark on exactly how it's going to react to a problem, but if it only has one or the other, uh, you know exactly how it's going to react. And then for the sake of this discussion, we're just going to assume it has one or the other. Um, if you run into one that has both, maybe do a little bit of experimenting and document that for yourself so you know how that engine management system works. But what type of issues are we going to see that these systems will react differently to? Uh, well, the most common one is vacuum leaks. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, valve timing issues, uh, EGR, valve problems if you're dealing with some older vehicles. I know there's not a whole lot of EGR nowadays, but there's still a few out there. And air intake duct leaks. So this would be the air intake duct before the throttle. If there's a tear in that boot or that tube, how's it going to react to that problem? It depends on what system we're talking about. So how's a mass airflow sensor system going to react to a vacuum leak? Um, well, we know how this works. It's probably going to stumble. And it does, depends on the size of the leak. It's probably going to stumble. It's probably going to maybe even stall if the leak's big enough. It'll have a misfire, a rough idle and lean conditions with a positive fuel trim. Okay, so you'll see fuel trims uh, heading in the positive direction. Again, this is gonna be mostly at idle because that's when vacuum leaks are most amplified. That's how a mass airflow sensor system is gonna react to a vacuum leak. But how about a speed density? How about one with a MAP sensor? How is that going to react to the same size vacuum leak? So let's say this is stumbling, idling rough, misfires at idle, lean conditions, positive fuel trims, and a mass airflow, how does that same vacuum leak affect a speed density system? And I'm sure you've seen this a lot of times. What it will actually do is almost none of those symptoms that I just mentioned, the idle speed will actually be increased if there's a vacuum leak on a speed density system. The fuel trims will remain relatively unchanged. The engine will not misfire. The engine will not stall. And again, the idle speed will increase. Now, again, this does depend on the size of the vacuum leak. You, get, you make a vacuum leak big enough and you will get stalling even from a speed density system. But if it's a small vacuum leak, they're going to react completely differently to one another depending on the system. Now, the reason that a mass airflow sensor reacts this way to a vacuum leak is it does not measure the incoming air mass that's sneaking in through a torn gasket or whatever it is, and we don't add enough fuel. And so there's more air than the computer expected, and we get a lean condition. But we're not measuring the actual air mass in a speed density system. We're using a calculation. And again, one of the biggest players here was manifold pressure. Well, guess what? If we have a vacuum leak, even a small one, it is going to change what the manifold pressure is. Okay, so imagine you have 21 inches of vacuum normally with no vacuum leaks. Well, now you create a vacuum leak and you drop that manifold vacuum a couple inches and now we're at 19 inches of vacuum. Well, the MAP sensor is going to pick that up no matter how small the vacuum leak or where it is, MAP sensor is going to pick that up. And what that indicates to the engine computer is an increased engine load. 
And so it will actually add more fuel because it says, well, there must be more air coming in to the engine because my manifold pressure dropped. Think about manifold pressure this way. At idle, we have a high vacuum level or a low manifold pressure if we're thinking on the absolute scale here, of course. And as we open that throttle, atmospheric pressure is going to come in and equalize itself with the pressure in the manifold. If we were to go to wide open throttle, the pressure on the outside of the manifold would equal the pressure on the inside of the manifold. Okay, And that's maximum fuel delivery because we're wide open throttle. So the closer that manifold pressure goes towards atmospheric, the more fuel we must need to add because engine load's going up. We're opening that throttle. That's our engine load signal to the computer is manifold pressure changing. So again, to go back to the vacuum leak, that changes our manifold pressure ever so slightly depending on the size of the leak. And the computer reacts by, okay, Manifold pressure went closer to atmospheric, and so that must mean an opening of the throttle or an increase on engine load, and so we got to add more fuel. Okay, so you have an idling engine with a vacuum leak. You've just added more air through a vacuum leak, and you added more fuel. That's all you need to get an engine to spin faster, and so that's what happens. Your idle speed increases because of that change in manifold pressure that the MAP sensor saw and reported to the PCM. So in a mass airflow sensor, it doesn't see the added air. In a MAP system, in a speed density system, it sees the additional air and it will add fuel and it's just going to raise the idle. Now, will this set a code? Uh, eventually it will because the computer is watching to see Okay, I want the idle speed here, but it's up here. It's also watching throttle position and manifold pressure, and there's going to be a point where it sets a code for this. Idle speed higher than commanded or a code about throttle position versus uh, manifold pressure, uh, rationality code. Depends on the system, but really, really small vacuum leaks, I've found a lot of times just go unnoticed by the computer, even the customer or the technician. Um, I mean, fact of the matter is you're going to fix a hundred mass airflow system vacuum leaks because of uh, rough running and codes and misfires and lean conditions to every one that you fix in a speed density. And I'm talking small, small vacuum leaks. I mean, think about it. If you've been out in the field, how many intake gaskets that you've fixed on speed density systems that leak only when cold. I'm sure you've probably done it. You've probably seen it, but you see it a hundred times more on mass airflow sensor vehicles because they are going to pick that up and have some noticeable symptoms. Even from a small vacuum leak, you get lean conditions, you get misfires, you get positive fuel trims and codes. But in a speed density system, if it's a small leak, especially on a cold engine where idle speeds kind of increased anyways, the customer driver of the vehicle and the computer may not notice this. They may not see this happening. So your experience might be a little different than mine, but I've not found myself very often trying to track down a small vacuum leak on a speed density system, you know, with a smoke machine or cranking vacuum test or anything like that, as opposed to how many I've had to do on a mass airflow system. And the reason is, you know, just what I explained to you on how they react differently to a vacuum leak. So this is an important piece of information to know if you're going to go into a diagnosis looking at what method does the engine computer use to measure incoming air mass. That is going to change the symptoms that that vehicle produces. So how about an air intake duct leak? And again, this is the air intake duct that is between the air filter and the engine or the throttle, I should say. What if there's a tear in that boot? How's that gonna affect a mass airflow se sensor system? Well, it's gonna be very similar to a vacuum leak. Uh, we call it false air. It's still unmetered air that the mass airflow sensor doesn't see and doesn't report to the computer, so we don't add the proper amount of fuel and we get a lean condition. Now, it won't re react exactly like a vacuum leak, but similar, similar enough for, for this argument. Now, how about a speed density system? If you have a big old tear in the boot of a speed density system, does it affect the way it runs? This Again, this is before the throttle, and it doesn't. The only thing, the only downside to this is you're going to be getting in unfiltered air, 
Okay, there could be debris and stuff going into the engine, but other than that, there are no drivability symptoms from this. You could tear that thing in half. Heck, you could leave it off and run the engine, and it's not going to necessarily affect the performance. Again, unfiltered air going into the engine, but other than that, it's still going to run exactly the same because it does not use that air duct in order to measure the incoming air like a mass airflow sensor system does. So again, we need to know that. That's important when we go into our diagnosis and looking at different problems. An air duct is something I'm looking at in a mass airflow system. You know, if I have a lean condition, it's not in a speed density system. How about a stuck open EGR valve? Now this is going back a little ways again. I realize EGR valves are kind of a thing of the past, but again, I still see them on plenty of vehicles out there. So let's just take a vehicle that has a stuck open EGR valve on a mass airflow sensor system. How's this thing going to run? Well, especially at idle, it's going to run pretty poorly and depending on how far that EGR is stuck open, uh, you know, a stumbling, idle, stalling, running pretty rough. What are fuel trims going to do on that particular vehicle? Uh, it's hard to say, but my guess is they're not going to be too terribly affected. Maybe a little bit on the lean side if there's a misfire caused by it, but for the most part, really not too much affected as far as fuel trims go, but it's going to run like garbage. Now, how about in a speed density system? If you have a stuck open EGR valve, how is this thing going to be affected? What are the symptoms going to be? You are going to have an engine that very well may run roughly at idle, very similar to a mass airflow sensor vehicle. But how are the fuel trims going to react in this vehicle? I can tell you they're going to be extremely negative. They're going to be reflecting a rich condition if you have a stuck open EGR valve. Here's the reason why. Again, this speed density system is going to look at manifold pressure to determine fuel delivery, to determine engine load. Well, if you open an EGR valve and you, it's stuck open in the open position, especially at idle, what's that going to do to your manifold pressure? Well, it's going to bring that manifold pressure a lot closer to atmospheric, which the computer responds to by adding more fuel. Okay, the engine load must be going up because our manifold pressure is going closer to atmospheric you know, reflecting an increase in an air mass entering the engine. So we got to add the fuel to match that. Well, you're actually pumping exhaust gases in there that are, are spent there. There's no oxygen or there's very little oxygen to be used there. So now you're just adding way more fuel than that engine needs at idle, which results in a rich condition, negative fuel trims that you know, the computer responds to by what the O2 sensor sees. So we're adding fuel because of a manifold pressure change, but there is no actual added air, like a vacuum leak. Again, the vacuum leak, there is actually air coming into the engine. The fuel that the MAP sensor compensates with just makes the engine spin faster. If it's an EGR leak, you're not getting extra oxygen in there, and that added fuel just makes a rich condition at idle. So uh, if you're dealing with an older speed density vehicle and there's a stuck open EGR valve, expect some negative fuel trims reflecting a rich condition because the computer is adding more fuel. And the same thing can actually happen with valve timing issues on a speed density vehicle. And we see this, you know, if a timing belt or timing chain jumps, that's a possibility. But one of the other common places that you see this is Hondas with adjustable valves. And I'm sure many of you have adjusted valves on Hondas. And one of the dead giveaways is you have negative fuel trims, uh, specifically at idle. Uh, the reason being is those valves are not opening and closing at the correct time because you know, of tight exhaust valves is usually the common reason and it affects the manifold pressure. Valve timing, the way the engine breathes is going to affect that manifold pressure. Once again, reducing the amount of vacuum, bringing the manifold pressure closer to atmospheric. Okay. And so once again, that map signal, the manifold pressure is a big indicator of engine load. If we bring the manifold pressure closer to atmospheric pressure, that means add more fuel, okay? This must be an increased engine load for whatever reason, we need to add more fuel. When in reality, the, the change in manifold pressure is just because of poor valve timing or misadjusted valves or going back to the last one, a stuck open EGR valve and the computer's just gonna add more fuel and actually create a rich condition 
because it's trying to respond to the map sensor and a, what it perceives as a change in engine load when that's not really the case. There's a problem. So you'll have a rich condition. You'll have negative fuel trims. Okay, the O2 sensor sees that the computer's adding too much fuel. It says, hey, back off, buddy. You're adding way too much fuel. But the computer's going to keep in that same place until the map sensor reads correctly, which until you fix the problem, it's not going to. Not the fault of the map sensor. The map sensor is doing the right thing. It's just reporting what it sees, but what it's seeing is an issue. Is the change in valve timing? Is the change in valve adjustment? Is the stuck open EGR valve? Now, here's the other thing that I see a lot, and kind of one of the reasons I really wanted to talk about this so that everybody's clear on it, everybody knows about this. Uh, very frequently, at least it, it's happened a lot in my recent memory, I get called into a shop and they say that this vehicle, it, well, the common, the term I heard recently was it's loading up on fuel. It's loading up on fuel. And I wasn't really sure what they meant by that, but they were trying to tell me that it, it was running rich and it was causing misfires on all the cylinders of the engine. And we think it's a computer. Can you come in and diagnose it? And I had another one very similar. Uh, this thing's misfiring on a bunch of different cylinders and we can't figure out why it's misfiring on a bunch of different cylinders. So, I mean, these, these were both uh, Dodge. Uh, well, one was a Dodge Ram and one was a Jeep, but same manufacturer Chrysler. They were both speed density systems and they were, according to the fuel trims, both running very rich. And they did run like garbage. They had misfires on a number of cylinders. But here's what they both had in common as well. There was a dead hole, okay, mechanical engine problem. I always do a cranking cadence test. That's like the first thing I do on vehicles just because it's easy, and especially on these because you can clear flood them. Press, hop in, press the accelerator down, and just just crank them. Okay, both of these vehicles, it would be like maybe that's not the best example of that, but it was not rhythmic. Okay, there was a there was a jump every time it hit a dead hole. You could hear the starter speed up. You could hear the engine cranking speed speed up when it hit this dead hole. Okay, so I know I got a mechanical engine problem and what it was on these particular engines doesn't matter. Here is what matters. When that happens, let's say you have a dead hole. Let's say you have a burnt exhaust valve, okay, for both of these vehicles, or we could just stay on one. They were, they were pretty much the same thing. One was, a, one was a broken valve spring and one was a bad piston, but mechanical engine problem, dead hole, no compression on a cylinder. Why is that causing a rich condition and multi-cylinder misfire? What's happening there? And the reason is pretty simple if you understand how these systems work. Think about this. Think about a vacuum gauge that you had connected to a vehicle, any vehicle, that had a dead hole, a cylinder with no compression. What is that vacuum gauge going to do? Well, it's going to bounce like crazy, but the overall vacuum level is going to drop. It's going to go closer to atmospheric pressure. Now it's bouncing, yes, but if you were to average it out as a reading, it's going to be closer to atmospheric. What's the map sensor in a speed density system going to do when it sees the engine running and the vacuum level has dropped? It has gone closer to atmospheric. Well, just like with a valve timing issue, just like with a vacuum leak, it's going to add fuel. It is going to perceive that as an increase in engine load and so it's going to run rich. Now, you got a dead hole, so you definitely have one misfire. But now it may be to the point, and it is in these vehicles, where it actually runs so rich that it causes misfires on other cylinders, specifically at an idle. And then all of a sudden, these technicians are chasing down multiple cylinder misfires. They're chasing down a rich condition when that's not really the problem. That is a reflection of the problem. You have a mechanical issue. So, I mean, doing a relative compression test or cra cranking cadence test is obviously a really simple check that you should do on any vehicle with a misfire. But in both cases here, the technicians that were working on the vehicle just truly didn't understand the difference between speed density, mass airflow. They didn't understand how these systems react to the different problems. And if you understand speed density, if you understand mass airflow, and you understand how these systems work, it all makes sense. It's pretty easy. It's something that I'm going to, you know, I look for right away when I see a rich condition on a speed density. Okay, what's my manifold pressure? 
what what's going on here because there's other possibilities for a rich condition but that's something i want to look at is what is my manifold pressure right now because that is going to change the amount of fuel delivered to that engine that map sensor is the leading uh, player in the calculation for speed density and how much fuel enters the engine when it's not on a mass airflow sensor system. You have a dead hole on a mass airflow sensor, you're still going to have a misfire, but you will not have a rich condition. It's probably going to be leaning closer to a lean condition, uh, maybe a little bit, not, not a whole lot. And you probably won't have a multi-cylinder misfire from one dead hole on a, on a mass airflow sensor system, but you definitely can on speed density. So they react completely differently to the same problem. As long as we understand how these work, uh, we can diagnose them. So that's it for this series. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Maybe it's a little basic uh, for some people. Maybe, maybe you learned quite a bit from it. Let me know. Uh, get on the Facebook group uh, or just message me and uh, let me know what you think of it. If you'd like more of these specific instructional episodes, I can definitely do more. If you have a specific topic that you'd like to hear about, um, I can talk about it or I can find somebody who knows more about it than I do. Uh, that's probably actually the way I'd prefer to go. But I do enjoy just talking about, uh, you know, the theory behind stuff. And I don't know, I have, always have all the answers, a lot of this stuff I have to research and figure out, just like all of us do. But uh, yeah, get on, get on Facebook, get in the group. And if uh, you're not in the group, check out the show notes to this episode and I'll have a link so that you can join and we can get some discussion going. But other than that, that's all I got for you. Thank you for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you again soon.